Okay, let's start. Um, when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, I got a lot of sorry calls, but I got one call of a joint friend of Oleg Chelsov who sits to the very right, and myself. His name was Oliver Jung. He said, come to Zurich, meet my friend Oleg. He needs a banker. And Lehman Brothers did something like what he needs, and I like you, you should really have a sit down with him. After a burger at Hyatt Hotel, Oleg decided, maybe I give this guy a chance, and we started working. Noah was called back then Marco Rodzinek, Internet and Technology Finance and Consulting. I managed to get a punchier name after a while. But what happened since then, uh, not only for Noah, but also for Fotolia, uh, is an amazing story. And before we start this uh, panel, I think I'd thank you a lot, but I would like to thank you again because, you know, the first is always the most difficult one. And Oleg founded a business which I think any banker in Europe would have loved to do the deal for. And I'm very thankful for his trust to work with me when Noah was even called what I said to you before. And when we did the first deal together with TA, it was not the, the end, it was the beginning of a fantastic journey, which brings me to the next gentleman to my right, Philip Freise, which you know from yesterday morning, who runs the media practice at KKR here in Europe, and who has done a phenomenal job tradition, uh, transforming his focus from traditional media to digital. Um, there was a little introduction, but I think we should start with Oleg a little bit, um, talking about Fotolia, which is, I think, one of the true European startups who, without any venture capital funding, by the way, managed to become one of the top three players in that interesting market of microstock. Oleg, share with us how it all started. So it all started when I was running my uh, previous company, which was a web hosting company, and uh, it was a startup at that time, and, uh, and I always had difficulties to uh, find images, illustrations to uh, illustrate our own website in a certain way. It was very expensive. You needed to, to buy a, a full CD for three or 400 euros to just get one nice image. And when I was continuing on this uh, startup, which was called Amen, a web hosting company, a lot of people who were coming to host also websites on, the, on, on our platform were also calling us the, the customer service and were asking also, how do we get to get free images licensed and, uh, and legal? So uh, there were no solution at that time. And when I sold this company in 2004, uh, I was searching for the next opportunity and all this uh, idea of providing uh, cheap, stock imagery uh, came in and uh, it was also the time when the, a lot of digital cameras were pumping up with better quality the internet was faster to upload and we started this marketplace for stock photography so uh, the way Fotolio works is extremely simple it's a marketplace where on one side you have um, photographers any photographers mostly now professionals but also amateurs by the way, we just launched also an iPhone app called Photolia Instance, so you can even upload um, uh, uh, what we call phonography, like uh, iPhone pictures. So people upload photography, and we have editors who uh, moderate the content, check the quality, if it's stock relevant, and uh, if it's legal images, also model released. And once the image uh, is accepted, it will enter the, uh, the search engine, and it will work like a search engine when any designer or art buyer in the world can come buy images and then we would pay share a fee uh, with the photographer so why this is a disruptive business is because it's crowdsourced so we like to call ourselves the uh, the the world of local images because we have today uh, close to 200,000 photographers from all over the world selling local imagery how many images you get per day we get around 50,000 so we have to we accept 50 percent more or less so we have 25,000 new images and so we have all these images coming from uh, all over the places and buyers can come and license images for as low as one dollar so it's a big difference with the price we used to pay at 300. And so how, how many customers do you roughly have? I don't know if it's we have millions of, uh, of customers worldwide, yeah, millions. So uh, today the company, I mean, it's kind of public with uh, over 100 million of revenue and it's growing very fast. And I think it's just the beginning, I mean, of uh, le legal licensing of images. Let me share with you a secret of Oleg. In the very, very early days of Fotolia, where the liquidity of the marketplace wasn't really running, he did something incredibly smart. When the first photographer came on, he bought from his own money a few images, spent like a few hundred bucks, 
and called the photographer and said, how is it going? And he said, you won't believe, I already sold 20 <coughs> images. <laughs> so he told all his photographer friends and immediately the thing kick-started. So sometimes in order to start a business, you have to think a little bit out of the box. I found this amazingly creative. Philip, when you met Oleg, you were really looking for your first big European internet deal. Your colleagues in the US have done a few before, and I know we worked on a lot of things, but I know that you looked at a lot of stuff. What was the key reason to say yes to Fotolia? I mean, as I said uh, last, uh, yesterday morning, the key reason first and foremost was Oleg. I think um, Oleg really stood out from all of the founders and entrepreneurs we had looked at, and he had a big vision. His vision wasn't enough to be the number one in Europe, but really to create the number one globally. And that was really very interesting. And the business model, as you know, we built BMG, the independent uh, leading music uh, rights company in the world. So we have, we're very comfortable with rights management, whether it's music or film and TV rights through ProSieben. And the next logical vertical was images. And um, that was a very exciting vision that Oleg had. And, you know, we found the right entrepreneur behind a big vision and putting more than capital in, and that really was it at the time. So let's, let's go to the conference theme, how big does it get? I think I saw an investor presentation of your peer in the US, Shutterstock, who I think earmarked already Microstock at I think two and a half billion or so. Uh, you are one of the top three players, iStock Photo, Shutterstock, Fotolia. How are you gaining market share and what's really next for you, especially looking at Philip, who I'm sure uh, had a few good things, interesting things to say to make you pick KKR because as Philip was looking for companies and had choices, you also had choices. We were talking back then to a lot of investors. What's next? What did Philip promise you? Philip, maybe uh, you want to address the first question and then uh, Oleg can talk about the next steps. You know, I promised Oleg that um, we looked at this really as, as a situation where we can help him grow into the global leader. I think since, since we invested, you have opened eight new, eight new countries uh, in far and flung away places where we have relationships at KKR. I think I also promised we own GoDaddy, the largest web hoster, that we can help there with, with, with something. But for mostly, I think we offered him the vision of, um, you know, being the entrepreneur that he is, run the company in a dynamic fashion, keep pushing, innovate, and it's really look to building something big together. So how big can it get? Um, definitely much bigger than today, and we have a lot of time. I think one of the things that I promised him as well is KKR has, a, has patience. And our average holding periods are seven years, which might be twice what the average holding periods of our peers is sometimes. So, you know, he, you know, and I think that's really the promise I made. So when people get married, the famous question after a while is, honey, would you marry me again? Would you marry Philip again? Yeah, for sure. And uh, I can give you an example. Uh, I mean, explain also why we chose uh, KKR. I mean, w w when you reach uh, the size of a company as, uh, as Fotolia, you can only deal, uh, I mean, if you want to raise money with a private equity because it's quite a big amount of money. And, uh, some of these uh, companies are a little bit institutional, you know, and KKR was the only one who was offering kind of, uh, for such a big company, a startup, you know, a mentality. I mean, all the team is very young and they're very, very, um, they understand what internet is, you know. Just as an example, if I send an email, you know, to Philip at 12 or even later at night, I mean, I get an answer in the next 10 minutes and I'm not sure that that's the case with many of the private equity careful, companies. Oh, <laughs> So uh, that, 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 that was one of the reasons. The second reason is, uh, is that they have a, a deep uh, knowledge of uh, media. You know, they have been investor in BMG, but also in ProZib, and, you know, so they know extremely well, you know, and we're in the media business with, with photography. And one of the, and the third very important thing also is that Europe and the German market in particular is, uh, is one of the key markets for Fotolia, and, uh, and um, um, uh, Philip as a partner of, uh, of KKR is German, and all the team, you know, most of the team was German, in fact, so it also helped a lot, and they have very, very deep connections, you know, with all the media industry in Germany, so it's a big plus, you know, for, uh, for, for Fotolia, and also uh, in, in the rest of the world. Yeah, I hope that every KKR portfolio company is uh, buying these beautiful images we are portraying here on the screen. When, when we did the deal the first time with T Associates, who is also still a shareholder, 
Oleg said something very interesting, and as a banker, I would like to share this with you because I learned a lot from Oleg during that year. Um, most of the investors ask Oleg, okay, you have built this company, it's nicely profitable, uh, you are the founder, if I give you a lot of money now, aren't you going to disappear to the beach? He looked at these people and said, no, for me it's very simple. I sell two-thirds of my business today, I keep one-third, and in three times I could get theoretically the same amount of cash back. He made it so simple in his kind of, I sell two-thirds and in three years I have the same cash back. That convinced everyone. What, what lesson you can share with the audience, because private equity, venture capital, gross capital, these are interesting people, right? They're incredibly analytical, smart, and most importantly, they would like to find the trust in the entrepreneur they work with as you guys build a trusting relationship. Is there any tips and tricks you can give to all the brave ones having meetings while we talk on stage in all the different rooms of this building and making the pitch to the investor? Well, I think uh, every company probably uh, is different and has a different DNA, but one thing uh, for sure, you know, is here and uh, with all the investors is that you need to be extremely data-driven. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, you can be as nice as you want, but what counts is numbers. So, uh, so it's very important to run a business, especially when you have growth, you know, but by tracking very well your numbers and maximizing it extremely well, you know, looking at the cohorts, you know, look at the price, uh, how much you spend to acquire customers, what is the lifetime value of your customers. And if you can present that in a, in a really smart and good, you know, and, uh, and summarized way to investors, you know, already, you know, there, a, a discussion will, uh, will, will come. I think it's especially on, on this size of deals, you know, when you want to do deals over 100 million, I would say numbers needs to speak. Not only, you know, hopes. It has to be a real business. After, of course, you add all the layer, you know, of the market, you know, potential, you know, team. But, uh, but yeah, this comes. Come with data. Yeah. And as Stefan Glenzer told us yesterday, show a little bit of passion around the data. Of course. I was just going to say that. It's a key key, of course, to be you know, in command of your own data and know really what takes your business. But if you, you have to come with a passion. You have to say, look, I want to sell steak not because of going to the beach, but because of the vision. I think that's what Oleg did when we met first. He was full of passion for Fotoya. And you know, that's really the most important for any investor to understand what the heart and soul of the business wants to do with it. So passion is number one, data is number two. When Oleg and I started the first deal, uh, a lot of investors had difficulties to believe that the business, I guess back then with around 35 people could operate without really a physical office. And by the way, we copied Oleg on that side. We also don't have an office at NOAA. And when he was asked by investors, why don't you have an office? He said, well, I don't want to feel guilty when I travel a lot and people don't see me around. Which, by the way, uh, he's working probably more than anyone in the office because he's, as Philip, always online. Um, no, but I think it also fits, you know, modern way of uh, life. And at the end of the day, I don't think that people work less, you know. Today, uh, I mean, we build very systems, you know, where we can track everything what people do, you know, and we see all the activity. And uh, at the end of the day, when people spend two, three hours, th there is nothing worse, you know, to be unhappy than commuting, taking three hours, you know, a train per day, you know, to go to an office. I think it's horrible. And uh, these three hours, I mean, could be in a way, you know, invested more uh, in, per in work. You see what I mean? At, at the end of the day, people, you know, they're kind of a little bit bored. You have a little bit of TV, a bit of something else. But if you used to work from home, I mean, you will connect at night on your computer, you know, work more. And this is what we experienced. And let me put that in context. Oleg has interviewed probably, when we started working, 90, 95% of his staff via Skype and hired them without ever having met them. He has a back office of probably now 400, 500 KPIs, which are real time on the second managed and measured, so in our investor meetings, he pressed the button, oh, I sold another five images. So every second, he's, he sold the images. And when we talk about meeting investors, I think I've, I've rarely met someone who has so many KPIs on literally the tip of his finger and answer investor questions. And this stuff is really important when you, when you face people like Philip, who bombard you with many questions.
Yeah, it's very important. And it's, uh, as an advice, I would say that it's really important to think about it in the beginning also. Because when you wait too long you know, to build all this stuff and back office and KPIs, it's, you, will not, you never get it done after. It becomes a mess. And, uh, and so uh, when you have time, I mean, if possible, I mean, of course. It you want to get, get it right from the beginning and set the DNA at the company. Yeah. So Philip, I know you don't like this question. And um, it's not the reason why I ask it. But I ask it because I really like to know the answer. So you invested in Fotolia, you said you have a long um, breath and you don't have a problem waiting seven years. But of course we cannot avoid the interesting valuation of Shutterstock, for example, in the US, who went public after you invested, which uh, I guess was a great confirmation for you for the business and the, and the model and how investors value it outside the world of KKR. What is your plan? Um, you built BMG with a lot of acquisitions. The music industry was highly criticized by many people as unsuitable for private equity. You went in there, you built a, a huge business, sold it to Bertelsmann eventually. What are we here to see in the Fotolia story? Are you trying to do also a roll-up? Are you looking at the US for an IPO? Uh, what, what is your strategy? And Maybe you share with us a little bit how it also involves the product strategy at Fotolia. I mean, lesson number one is I don't get excited if uh, Shutterstock uh, gets valued at certain levels. I think we are extremely focused on building this business. We are extremely excited about seeing how much we sold at the end of every day. The, you know, the secret is we email each other at midnight because we're getting at five to midnight the, the daily sales figure, which is extremely exciting. Yeah? So, <laughs> I don't care what the stock price of any competitor is because I believe in Fotolia. I think Oleg has a better product than they have. I think he has a better strategy and we'll conquer the world together. Yeah? What is my plan for Fotolia? I think uh, Oleg uh, and, and I will talk about this over time. We are now in our first year of investment. I think we have taken the company now to 24 countries. Um, when we invested it was 12 or 13. So there's a lot more to do. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, as you say, it's based on the product, it's based on the sales force, it's based on operational things, it's not based on valuations of, of any competitor. It's always great if you see that what you do is highly valued, and that's why we love the space, but that's not the focus. Excellent. Key, key is growth. What we need is to grow, and I think it's still, you know, the, uh, j just the visible part of the iceberg, because uh, today, if you look, I mean, in a certain way, you know, and we need to take some actions probably against this, Google Images, I mean, it's just, you know, a way to pirate images. People are just downloading high What's a percent of image use which is paid for? Uh, I think it's a couple pirate. of percent. I think a couple of percent are paid, and, and 90 over percent are just, you know, stolen with, without any uh, And the main reason rights. they steal is because they do not know about services like Fotolia. Yeah, they well do enough. not know, or, 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 or uh, until now they have not been uh, kind of punished, you know, for using them. You know, so uh, cases are coming more and more there, and uh, and uh, and Google also is not helping in a certain way because you know they're just displaying, you know, a kind of you know a high-res images, you know, that is just ac accessible one click. So it's a way to pirate, and uh, but people are getting more and more conscious, you know, about uh, about the copyright issues, you know, and uh, paying one dollar for an image not to take any risk is the right solution, you know, be, instead of make savings like really, you know, penny sa savings and take risks for your business. I'm, I mean, the dynamic was very similar in music. When we started investing in music, everybody thought we are crazy because 80% of music was pirated. If you look at these numbers now, they are much lower. Um, in fact, they are below 50% now. Um, so a huge shift from piracy to actually legal services. And I mean, Fotoya is offering a really highly affordable, easy to use service that any publisher can use without spending lots of money. And therefore, the intrinsic growth is very similar to music with Spotify and streaming services, which, which make it easier now, is there, which is extremely exciting. Yeah? Good. Well, let's talk about growth. I hope that all the conference organizers are buying their images from now on on Fotolia. And talk about punishment, Harry looks at me, I don't want to overrun the time. So we're going over to Russia and have an exciting Russian panel. Thank you very Thank much, you. Oleg. Sure. Thank very you very much, Philip.